Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our session on UNICEF implementation, uh, UNICEF policy uh, guidance uh, uh, for AI and children's rights. Um, this is uh, a session where we are going to show how we, our team, uh, extended, extended team, uh, tried to implement some of the guidelines that UNICEF published a couple of years ago. I would like to welcome, first of all, our online moderator, Daniela Di Paola, uh, who is a PhD candidate at the MIT Media Lab. Hi, Daniela. And she's going to help uh, for the online uh, and the decent speakers. And uh, here we have also, uh, I would like to uh, invite Stephen Boslow and Randy Gomez to come, our, my co-organizers, to come and, uh, on the stage and we can set the scene to start to kick off the meeting. Thank you. So, First, let me introduce Stephen Voslo. Uh, Stephen is a digital policy innovation and ed tech specialist with a focus on emerging technology. And currently, she is a digital foresight and policy specialist for UNICEF based in Florence, Italy. Uh, Stephen was the person behind the uh, policy guidance uh, on AI and children's rights uh, at the UNICEF. And uh, Stephen, you can probably explain more about this uh, initiative. Thank you. Thanks, Vicky, and good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to those online. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm a digital policy specialist, as, as Vicky said, with UNICEF, and I've spent, uh, I spent my time at UNICEF looking at the intersection mostly of emerging technologies and how children use them and are impacted by them and the policy. Um, so we've done a lot of work around AI and, and children. Um, our main project was started in 2019 um, in partnership with the government of Finland and funded by them, um, and they've been a great partner over, over the years. So at the time, 2019, um, AI was a very hot topic then as it is now, and we wanted to understand if children are being recognized in national AI strategies and in ethical guidelines um, for responsible AI. And so we, we did some analysis and we found that um, in most national AI strategies at the time, children really weren't mentioned much as a stakeholder group. And when they were mentioned, they were either needing protection, um, which they do, but there are other needs, or um, thinking about how children need to be trained up as the future workforce. So not really thinking about all the needs um, unique needs of every child and their characteristics and their developmental kind of journey um, and their rights. So we also looked at ethical AI guidelines. In 2019, there were more than 160 guidelines. Um, again, we didn't look at all of them, but generally found a not a sufficient attention being paid to, to children. So why, why do we need to look at children? Well, of course, at UNICEF, we have the um, our kind of guiding roadmap is um, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So children have rights, they have all the human rights plus additional rights, as you know. Um, one third of all online users are children. And in most developing countries, that number is actually is higher. And then thirdly, AI is already very much in the lives of children. Um, and we see this in their social apps, in their gaming, um, increasingly in their education. And they're impacted directly as they interface with AI um, or indirectly as algorithmic systems kind of um, determine health benefits for their parents or loan approvals or not or welfare subsidies. Um, and now with generative AI, which is the hot topic of the day, um, AI that used to be in the background has now come into the foreground. So children are interacting, interacting di 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 directly. Um, so, very briefly, at the time, after this initial analysis, saw the need to develop some sort of guidance to governments and to companies on how to think about the child user um, and as they develop AI policies and develop AI systems. So we, we followed a consultative process. We spoke to experts around the world 
Um, some of the folks are here. And we engaged children, which was a really rich and necessary um, step, and came up with a draft policy guidance. And we recognize that it's easy, fairly easy to arrive at principles for responsible AI or responsible technology. It's much harder to apply them. They come into tension with each other. Um, the context to which they applied matters, they, they replied. So we released a draft and said, why, don't, why doesn't anybody use this document and tell us what works and what doesn't um, and give us feedback and then we will include that in the next version. And so we had people in the public space um, apply it, like Yoti, the age assurance company. And we also worked closely with eight organizations. Two of them are here today, um, Honda and JRC, uh, Honda Research Institute and JRC, and Emisi 3D, and Judith is on her way. Um, and basically said, apply the guidance, and let's work on it together in terms of your lessons learned and what works and what doesn't. So that's what we'll hear about today. It was a really, uh, um, a really Real pleasure to work with you know, JRC and Honda Research Institute and to learn the lessons. Um, and so, yeah, just in closing, AI is still very much a hot topic. It's an incredibly important issue to get right or technology to get right. Um, it is just increasingly in, in the lives of children. Like I said, with generative AI, um, there are incredible opportunities for personalized learning, for example. Um, and for engagement with, with chatbots um, or kind of virtual assistants. But there are also risks. That virtual assistant that helps you with your homework could also give you poor mental, uh, mental health advice. Um, or you could tell it something that you're not meant to and there's an infringement on your privacy and on, on, on your data. So, as the different governments now try to regulate a AI and regional blocks and the UN trying to coordinate, um, we need to prioritize children, we need to get this right, there's a window of opportunity, and we really need to learn from what's happening on the ground and in the field. So, yeah, it's a real pleasure to, to kind of have these experiences shared here as bottom-up inputs into this important process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, indeed, uh, and at that point, uh, um, we had already some communication with uh, UNICEF uh, through the JRC of the European Commission, but already we had uh, an established collaboration with the Honda Research Institute in uh, Japan, uh, at evaluating the system uh, in different technical, uh, from a technical point of view, trying to understand what is the impact of robots on children's cognitive processes, for example, or social interactions, etc. And there is an established field uh, of child robot interaction in the wider community of uh, human robot interaction. And that was uh, when we discussed with Randy uh, to apply for um, this case study to UNICEF. Uh, and I think Randy now, uh, he can give us uh, uh, some of the context from a technical point of view, what uh, this uh, uh, meant for uh, the Honda Research Institute and his team. Randy? Um, yeah, so as what Stephen mentioned, um, so there was this um, policy guidance and um, we were invited by UNICEF to do some pilot studies and to implement some and test this policy guidance. So that's why we at, at um, Honda Research Institute, we developed technologies in order to, to do the pilot studies. So um, our company is very much interested with um, looking into embodied mediation where we have robotic technologies and AI embedded in uh, the society. And as I mentioned earlier, um, as a response to UNICEF's call to actually implement the policy guidance and to test it, we um, allocated um, a significant proportion of our um, research resources to focus into developing um, technologies for children. In particular, we are actually developing the um, embodied mediator for cross-cultural understanding, where we develop this um, um, robotic system that facilitates cross-cultural interaction. Um, so we develop this kind of technology where you have actually the system connect to the cloud and having a robot facilitates the interaction between um, two different um, groups of children from different countries. And before we um, do the actual um, implementation and uh, the, the study for that, we, through the um, UNICEF policy guidance, we tried to look into how we could actually implement this and looking into 
um, some form of like um, interaction design between children and robots. So we did deployment of robots in hospitals, schools, and homes. And we also um, look into the impact of robotic application when it comes to um, social and cultural economic perspectives with children from different countries or different backgrounds. And um, we also look into um, the impact of robotic technology when it comes to children's development. So um, we, we, we tried some experiments with ro a, a robot facilitating interaction between children in um, some form of like um, um, game kind of application. Um, finally, we also look into how we could actually um, put our system and our pilot studies in the context of some form of standards. So that's why together with JRC, with Vicky, we look into applying our application with uh, the IHEEE standards. And um, with this, we had a lot of partners. We built a lot of collaborations we, uh, here, actually, and we are very happy to work with them. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, both of you. So this, uh, this was to set uh, the scene uh, for the rest of the session today. So um, as Randy and Stephen mentioned, uh, this was um, quite a journey for, for all of us. And around this project, there are a lot of people, a great team uh, here, but also 500 children from 10 different countries, where on purpose we chose to have a large uh, cultural variability. Uh, so uh, we have some initial results, and uh, for the next uh, part of the session, we have this, uh, invited some people that actually participated in these studies. So thank you very much, both of you. And I would like to invite first uh, Ryuma. Um, uh, Ryuma is uh, our one of the students uh, that Thank you. Uh, Ryuma, you can come over. Uh, Ryuma is a student uh, at the high school here uh, in Tokyo. Uh, and uh, you can take a seat if you want uh, here. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, and he's here with his um, uh, teacher and uh, our collaborator, Tomoko Imai. Um, and uh, we have online also uh, Joy. Joy is a teacher uh, at the school in Uganda where we um, tried to implement uh, participatory action research, which means that we brought uh, the teachers uh, in the design, in the uh, research team. So for us, uh, educators are not only part of uh, the end user uh, studies, but also part of the research. So we. Um, uh, we interact with them all the time in order to set also research questions that come directly from the field. So we are going to start. Uh, you can you can sit here. Uh, do you want or you want to stand? Whatever you want. Uh, I want to stand. Yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, uh, three questions for you. First, uh, we would like first to tell us about your experience uh, in this process uh, on. Uh, uh, participating in our studies. Okay. Um, we have online English conversation classes once per week in the school. And, uh, but we often have the, some problem in continuing the conversation. With our participation in the HAR project, we had a chance to talk with children from Australia with the help of HARU and this may somehow different. For example, sometimes there was a moment of silence, but Haru could feel these moments and made conversation smoother. Also, during the conversation, Haru would make interesting facial expressions and make conversation fun for us. During the project, we had a chance to design robot behaviors and we interacted with engineers, which was really nice. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, during the project, probably you faced uh, some challenges, uh, or uh, I mean, uh, uh, there were uh, some moments uh, where you thought that, uh, oh, this project is very difficult to get done. Do you have anything to tell us about this? The platform is still not stable, 
and sometimes there was uh, uh, system trouble. Uh, for example, once the robot was overheated and could not cool down. So I had to stop interaction and uh, start again. But overall the experience was positive because I had a great time in talking with professional researchers who are uh, trying to fix a problem. Um, being able to work in this international researcher, it was very variable experience for me. Thank you, Rima. And uh, do you want to tell us how would you imagine the future of education uh, for you? I mean, through your eyes, you're now in the education. So uh, if uh, in the near future you have uh, uh, the possibility to interact more with robots or artificial intelligence within the formal education, how this would look like for you? I hope that uh, Haru can help connect many students in different countries. And uh, ro robots can be a partner to practice the conversation be, uh, by taking different roles, like teachers, friends, and so on. And uh, probably um, use of AI's evaluation system can be more fair. Yeah. OK. So thank you very much, Ryuma. Uh, this was the intervention from one of our students, but uh, yeah, next time probably we can have more of them. Uh, and now I would like, you, you can uh, probably succeed, too, yeah. You can take a seat there. It's a seat here. Yeah. The question would be like that. Um, and now probably um, we, we have an online speaker, uh, Joy. Um, can you hear us, Joy? Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. So Joy uh, is one of uh, our main uh, core collaborators. Uh, she's an educator at a rural area in uh, Uganda, in um, uh, Bududa. Uh, her school uh, is um, uh, quite remote, I would say, through uh, another collaborator of ours, the year in the, uh, we uh, had an uh, interaction with her initially, we explained our project to her, and we asked uh, if we could have uh, some sessions. So our main goal to include uh, a school from um, such a different uh, economic, but also cultural, cultural uh, background, was to see if uh, when we talk about children's rights, um, this mean exactly the same for all the situations. Does the economic uh, um, or the cultural context play any role here? So what we did, it was to bring together the students from Tokyo, this urban area, and uh, the students from Uganda, to explore the concept of fairness. So we ran, um, um, we ran studies on storytelling, and uh, we asked children to talk about fairness in different scenarios, everyday scenarios, uh, technology, and robotic scenarios. And uh, now, um, Joy, would you like to talk a little bit about your experience uh, participating in our studies? Yeah, I'm excited, and thank you very much for inviting me to attend the conference. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Joy. And I'm an educator from a school called Bunao Marigudu Samaritan, which is found, of course, in Uganda, in the rural setting. Uh, it has a total number of, like, 200 students who are in the age bracket of 5 to 18 years old. Most of the, like, these students live close to the school, and their parents are generally, like, peasants. Uh, the greatest benefit from being involved in the project has been the exposure like to my students and the project has enabled our students to participate and have hands-on experience that enhance their understanding and interest in technology and other cultures. It was the first time for them to talk to children like in Japan and you know other countries that really was a great experience for them. Like, additionally, a great bonus was like language learning, whereby the students were able to engage in interactive practices and they received at least the feedback on their language skills. Like, you could find that they learned how to express themselves in Swahili and English. 
Uh, what we thank a lot, like the session we are well planned and would really capture our students' attention and it had to increase the engagement, the session that we all had during the activities we were handling. Uh, what I feel like in the opinion, what I heard was the project really enabled the social and emotional learning whereby the development of the social skills, the consideration of emotional intelligence, you know, feeling the compassion for the peers in Japan, they really enjoyed and they learned about the, the Japanese culture and the school in all. Thank you so much, Joy. Um, and uh, if you want to tell us a little bit about possible uh, challenges that you faced while you were participating in our studies and uh, um, we, we didn't have, of course, we didn't have the opportunity to have a robot uh, at the school um, there. So this is something that was not, I mean, we, we are in very initial phases where we do ethnography. So probably this will be in the future, but uh, already we had some other interactions and discussions with uh, Joy. So would you like to tell us a little bit the challenges that you faced, even with the technology, the simple technology that we used uh, during our project? I think you really like in my opinion the major obstacle was the limited resources we had at the local level post in Uganda and the school being at the local setup. Good Samaritan is a no local setup that has a budget constraint, making it like difficult to invest in technology. And also we found that the internet connection was not all that stable, like the way you used to witness with here. And it really made the work to, you know, participating in online sessions were, was a little bit too, very hard to catch up with the timing. Uh, another issue we had was to do with the curriculum integration, whereby we feel like there should be a need to engage the Ministry of Education back in Uganda to integrate the project so that there is additional resources, the time, the adjustment to teaching methods. Thank you, um, uh, Joy. And what is your vision for the future? What would you like to have for the future in the context of this project? Oh, thank you. Like the most important aspect for us is the funding of such projects. First, the government should provide the infrastructure for a stable internet connection for all. This is like a basic need for the integration of technology in the school. And you have to find that you find a school like Good Samaritan. There is no power. There is no any internet connection. What we were only using like one phone, maybe one laptop, which was really hard. So in case there is that funding, it will hope to ease the connection of the internet to the children. Uh, we also have, need to feel like the resources and the necessary materials like the intelligent systems, the robots, the computer equipment as in the schools. Like you find that Japan, you know, the children could feel like their other students had computers. So this way, like our students will have equal access to information like how we saw it in Japan. Uh, for the future, we envision like our schools have not only the necessary technology such as computers and robots for the students, but also trained teachers. We feel AL literacy is important for all students and teachers. We hope that all the educators have the opportunity to participate like on those online workshops and trainings feel confident about the technology in their everyday teaching. Uh, like Vicky, as you understand, our participation in this project was a great opportunity to our students. And we hope that at, at least, not, not only at the beginning how we started it, but we will continue with this exciting project to grow up and we excel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joy. Uh, it was a great pleasure it has been to work with uh, Joy and the school. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your intervention today. Great. So now we can, um, uh, I don't know if Judith uh, is around. Judith, you're here. Great. So I would like to in invite uh, Judith. So. Uh, as Stephen said beforehand, this uh, was one, I mean, our project is one of the eight case studies where we tried to implement um, the guide, some of the guidelines uh, from UNICEF. Uh, today we want also to um, uh, take a taste from another uh, case study. 
So Judith, uh, I need to read your uh, short bio because it's super rich. Eh? <laughs> so um, uh, welcome to the session, first of all. Uh, Judith is a technology evangelist and business psychologist with experience working in Africa, Asia, and Europe. In 2016, uh, she set up Imisi 3D, a creation lab in Lagos focused on building uh, the African ecosystem for extended reality technologies. Um, she is a fellow of the World Economic Forum uh, and uh, she's uh, affiliated with the Graduate School of uh, Harvard, uh, School of Education. So the floor is yours, uh, Judith. Uh, thank you very much, Vicky. Um, good afternoon, everybody. What a pleasure it is to be here with you all today. I just want to tell you briefly about my engagement with UNICEF as part of um, the pilot for um, working with the guidance for the use of AI with children, which is really pivotal for us. Um, but before I start, I want to give you some context about the work that I do. I run Emissy 3D. Uh, we describe ourselves as an XR creation lab and we are headquartered in Lagos, Nigeria. Our work is to do whatever we can to grow the ecosystem for the extended reality technology, so augmented virtual and mixed reality across the African continent. In service of that, we focus activities in three main ways. Uh, the first I describe as evangelization. We do whatever we can to give people their first touch and feel of the technologies, give them access to it, and help them to understand the possibilities today. The second focus area for us is to support the growth of an XR community of professionals across the African continent. We believe that if we're to reap the benefits of these technologies, then we must have people with the skills and knowledge who can adopt and adapt these technologies for our purposes. And then for us, the third aspect is committing our time and resources to areas in which we think there's room for immediate significant impact with these technologies for society today. And in service of that, we do work in healthcare, in education, in storytelling, and in digital conservation. And that healthcare piece is what brings me here today for this particular um, brief talk. Um, so a number of years ago um, in Nigeria with uh, a partner um, company called Astokes.com, we conceived of a project called Autism VR. Um, and I'll give you a bit of background as to why that is. So Nigeria, if you're familiar with it, is a country of 200 plus million people. Um, it's a country that I would say is severely under-resourced when it comes to mental health care. Um, I don't want to go into the numbers in terms of, you know, uh, providers to the population, but it is really, really worrying. Alongside that, there is significant stigma um, attached to mental health care as well in the country. And so you can imagine the situation for children who might be neurodiverse and the ways in which they are often excluded from society. Um, so with Astokes.com, we conceived a game called Autism VR. It's a voice-driven uh, virtual reality game that does two things. So first of all, it provides basic information about autism spectrum disorder. And then the second element of it is that after providing that information, you then have the opportunity to, through voice interaction, um, engage with a family that has a child on the spectrum um, and then see if you can sort of like put some of the things you've learned into practice. That's the idea and we're still developing this. Um, so we had started on that, you know, for uh, about a year or two um, when we were very fortunate to be introduced to Steve and his incredible team and the guidance on the use of AI, with ch um, use of AI for children. Um, I would say that prior to this, we had spent a lot of our time believing we were following a human-centered you know, human design approach to our product development um, in terms of wanting to build with all of these, you know, I suppose commendable considerations. We wanted to increase awareness. We wanted to foster inclusion. We wanted to support children who were neurodiverse. But the guidance really helped us shift our perspective from just being broadly human-centered to being specifically child-centered in our design approach. And for it, um, we focused on three main indicators from that guide. Um, we wanted to uh, prioritize fairness and non-discrimination. And the way that would typically show up um, in you know, a country like Nigeria is just exclusion, right, for children who are neurodiverse or children who um, the general public would 
have to work a little bit more to understand or to engage with, right? Um, we wanted to foster inclusion. We wanted more people to have the knowledge to understand that the behavior they might see might not be behavior that they should just consider sort of like off the scale and not worth engaging in. And we really, really wanted to do all we can to support the well-being and positive development of children who are on the spectrum. And we believe that by creating awareness, we can do this. Um, in the, oh, <laughs> just checking, there'll be an image um, up in the screen in a minute. Um, and it's a screen grab from, from the game. An, an early version of it, so, so know that it's improved. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about sort of like what the experience is like. Um, so in the first scene, um, there's a woman called Asabe, and she's a woman who is in sort of like the front room of a typical house in Lagos. Uh, you go into the room and you engage her and then she starts to talk to you and she provides information about autism spectrum disorder. So she gives you general basic information. Um, she checks your understanding every few sentences and you respond and let her know whether you understood or not. If you don't, you know, she'll go back. Um, and then when you're done with that, she then says, please go ahead and visit your family, friends, your carfers. So the idea is that you're then going through another door into a typical living room, the kind you would find in Nigeria. And when you get into that room, there's a family, you're greeted by the parents, and they welcome you, and then they say, uh, here's our son, Tinde. See if you can get him to come and greet you. We'll go and get you some refreshments. And then they exit the room, and then you get to attempt to engage with their son. And the idea is that if you're able to do that, um, if you're able to do that uh, using the tools and the tips that you've gotten from the previous scene, then eventually Tunde will not just kind of like engage with you by establishing eye contact, but he will actually stand up and come to you and say, you know, good afternoon, auntie, or good afternoon, uncle, as the case may be. Um, when we started building this game, we were building it for. Um, the Oculus of Rift, <laughs> letting you know just how long ago that was. Um, but the idea right now is to build for the Google Cardboard. Um, I have one here. And that's really because this is a game um, that, first of all, will be an open source product, but is really being built for the people and being built to ensure that more people have an understanding of what autism spectrum disorders are, what neurodivergence is, and are able to engage with it. Um, it's been challenging building for the cardboard, but we also know that if we want it to scale um, in a place like Nigeria where there isn't ready access to virtual reality headsets, then that's definitely the way to go. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Judith. Um, we had a small practical uh, no problem, but we yeah. are going to show it uh, okay. afterwards, okay, okay, because we have a description, yeah. Okay. But, uh, Thank you so much Thank for you. uh for the description for your job. Excellent. Now um we have an online um keynote speaker, uh Daniela, uh it's off to you for now. Hello. Yes. Hi everyone. Um it's my pleasure to introduce Dominic Register, who is a director of education for the Center of, for Education Transformation at Salzburg Global Seminar, where he's responsible for designing, developing, and implementing programs on the futures of education with a particular focus on social and emotional learning, educational leadership, regenerative education, and education transformation. He works on a broad range of projects across education policy, practice, transformation, and international development, including as a director of a model alliance as a senior editor for Diplomatic Courier, to mention a few. Thank you, Dominic. Thanks, Daniela. Good morning, Vicky. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak with you all. Is the audio okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, you can, oh, we can hear Great. you okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Um, so like Daniela said, I'm the director of something called the Center for Education Transformation, uh, which is part of Salzburg Global Seminar. Um, Salzburg Global Seminar is a, a small NGO 
uh, based in Salzburg in Austria, that was founded just after the Second World War as part of a, a European or transatlantic peace building initiative. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the education landscape globally at the moment um, and about why there is such a compelling case for education transformation. Um, so the beginnings of this is really, you know, it predates COVID and there was an increasing understanding that the world and that the vast majority of education systems had gone into what, what's being described as a learning crisis that students in education around the world, and this is particularly K-12 education, were not meeting literacy and numeracy levels, and that schools weren't, school systems weren't equipping students with the kinds of skills that were going to be needed to address key concerns within the 21st century. There was also a growing realization that education systems had in many ways perpetuated some of the big social injustices that we've been dealing with for the last few years. Um, then COVID happened. And COVID, as schools were locked down at one point in 2020, there were something like 95% of the world's school aged children were not in school. Um, what, one of the things that COVID did for global education systems was it shone a light on the massive inequalities that can exist within, that do exist within and between systems. And as there was greater understanding of these inequalities, as parents were much closer to the, the process of learning and seeing what their children needed to do, it, it helped catalyze this really interesting debate that is still playing out at the moment as to whether we were using the time that we have children in school for in the most productive ways. So you put the inequalities from COVID alongside the big social justice movements like Black Lives Matters or like Me Too, so looking at gender equality or looking at racial justice, um, alongside the climate crisis and the way in which the climate crisis is impacting on more and more people's lives, but in a very unequal, unequal manner. Um, all of this catalyzed this great process of education transformation. So last, last September, September 2022, uh, UNESCO and other UN agencies, UNICEF included, hosted um, what was called the Transforming Education Summit in New York, which was the largest education convening in about 40 years. Um, and the purpose of the summit was to try and help share great practice and innovation and also to catalyze a process of education transformation because there was a realization that education systems may have been contributing or had been contributing to these different um, challenges that now needed to be addressed. Um, so issues of inequality, issues of the learning crisis, um, issues of social justice. Um, there are now 141 UN member states have started a process of education transformation and that have developed plans and um, approaches um, as to what it is that they want to transform. Um, after the summit, uh, an amazing organization called the Center for Global Development did an analysis um, of the key themes that were coming through from the transforming, uh, from the transformation plans. Um, so this is based on a, a key word analysis um, of what had been submitted for the proposals um, for different systems to transform their systems. So the key, the top issue by a very long way is around teaching and learning. Um, there was then the second most important issue was around teachers and teacher retention, um, which is not, not that surprising. Um, the teaching profession as a whole globally, a third of teachers leave the profession, leave the profession globally every 12 years at the moment. Um, the third issue was technology, but when we've dived into the technology, it isn't particularly about AR, it is more about device deployment and access to the internet. Um, then there were employment skills, uh, there were issues of inclusion, issues of access, and the climate crisis. Um, so they were sort of most of the top 10. Um, and these are the issues that were coming from ministers of education, from, from national education systems. Um, 
as you will all know, education around the world, you know, there are, there are an enormous number of civil society organisations around the world that support um, education and education reform and transformation. And so alongside the analysis of um, the key words that were coming up in the transforming education policies or approaches, um, there is also a kind of parallel analysis of what civil society priorities are for transforming education. Um, and some of the key things that are coming up from civil society organisations um, are around intergenerational collaboration in education transformation, um, how systems can pivot to being more collaborative and less competitive. So more collaborative and less competitive, that is both within and between systems. Um, a very strong focus on social emotional learning and psychosocial support and mental health and well-being of teachers and students around the world. Um, and then this idea of how, how transform systems can contribute to more inclusive futures or address some of these long-standing structural social injustices that have existed for many, many decades. Um, the reason for mentioning all of this in this kind of context to the global transforming education movement, which is, is kind of a year in now, is, is really to pose the question that is AI addressing these things in the right way? Is the, is the tech sector and people who are developing AI applications for education responding to the key concerns that are coming from the education profession? Um, I think there is a very, very acute concern that as more systems spend more resources on the application of AI and education, it is also going to increase a digital divide, um, which is already very clear between education systems and between students who have access to AI or who are skilled in, in using it and understand how to use it and those that don't. Um, I think I, I'm in, I'm in, I usually live in Salzburg in Austria. I'm in London uh, at the moment because I've been speaking at something at, at a, something called the Wellbeing Forum. And the theme of the Wellbeing Forum this year was around human well-being in the age of AI. Um, the, the conference happened all day yesterday. And it's a sort of, it's a meeting of business, uh, of education, um, of health professionals, um, of religious and other spiritual leaders and of tech entrepreneurs. And one of the key themes that came through yesterday was the high degree of anxiety that all these different, all these representatives of different sectors have about, about AI and about AI, the, the risk that AI can pose to, to ways of life. Um, one of the most interesting quotes that came from yesterday, which I wanted to, to share with you all, so I come to the end of what I wanted to say, um, was, in, in the rush to be modern, are we missing the chance to be meaningful? Um, and as people lean more and more into the possibilities of AI, are we also losing out on the chance to focus on things that are really important in our societies or in our education systems? And so what I really hope that this short presentation or this short talk has been able to do is share some of the key themes or key trends that are taking place in education transformation around the world. Um, and would really encourage you all, if you have the chance to engage with teachers or with education leaders, um, system leaders or institution leaders, to, to take the time to listen to what are the key concerns within the sector at the moment and how can AI be applied um, to addressing some of these concerns and what can that do to address the anxiety that exists in global systems around digital divide or the lack of understanding of AI um, or how the, the risk that it is going to exacerbate inequalities within systems or between systems. So thank you very much for the chance to speak with you all today um, and I wish you all a very successful rest of conference. Thank you so much, Dominique. Thank you. Uh, I hope you will stay a little bit more with us uh, because we have a Q&A uh, afterwards. Uh, so is this okay with you, right?
Yes, it's fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, now it's a great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Bernard uh, Sendhoff, uh, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the uh, Global Network Honda Research Institute uh, and leader of the Executive Council formed of the three um, uh, research institutes in the Europe, Japan and the US. The floor is yours. Great, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Vicky. Thank you, um, Stephen. Thank you, Randy, for organizing this uh, wonderful workshop here and for inviting me to say a few words about um, what brought Honda, uh, a company like Honda, uh, into the domain of AI for children, what we find so exciting about this and um, how we want to go about, uh, about it in the future and what we plan to do. Now, the, the Honda Research Institutes are the advanced research arm of the Honda Corporation and our mission is really twofold. On the one hand, we want to enrich our partners with innovations um, that address uh, um, new products, services and also experiences. Um, at the same time, we also really do science and we want to create knowledge um, for a society that flourishes. And these are kind of like really our two legs we stand on, on the one hand, the scientific effort, on the other hand, on bringing this scientific effort actually into uh, innovations. And our founder, so Chiro Honda, was very much about dreams of the future. And we think about the future. When I talk to young researchers, I, I often say, you know, it's a, it's a privilege that we have in creating the future, but it's also a responsibility. And when you judge your own work, just ask yourself, is the future you are creating the future you want your children to live in? And um, this already connects us a little bit with um, the role of children in our research, because for researchers, when we create the future innovations, it's really about the innovations our children will be using. At the same time, we have to say, and Stephen mentioned that we have seen a tremendous success in AI and many other technologies in the last decade. However, at the same time, we have to honestly say, if you just switch on the, the news for a couple of minutes, we haven't really particularly been very successful in making that society a lot more peaceful uh, or a lot more happy with this technology. Uh, and one of the issues what we looked at was the rising alarm of a rising social fragmentation. And you see this in almost all societies and we see that the only way to address this is to focus a lot more on togetherness in societies. Um, and togetherness, of course, uh, starts with, with the children. Um, it's our children uh, who can learn how to respect differences across cultures and how to enjoy diversity towards something that is maybe a very long-term dream of something like a global uh, citizenship. So, um, we, we started thinking about how can we use AI innovations in order uh, to empower children um, to understand more about each other. And we called it Target CMC, and uh, Randy already talked a little bit about um, how together with a, with a great work um, from Vicky and others, we have been able to actually bring this to life and use embodied AI technology, the tabletop robot, Haro that we developed at the Honda Research Institute Japan in order to mediate between different cultures uh, in different schools um, in Australia and in Japan. That was our first target scenario. But as you can see on, on, on the list here, um, we envisioned to uh, expand this quite substantially. And uh, I highlighted um, on the slide here in particular two extensions. One. Uh, really going into uh, um, developing countries like Uganda, where, of course, we have the, the cultural experience, and we heard the, the wonderful ceremony earlier um, uh, um, uh, about the cultural experience are, again, a lot, a lot di more different than, for example, between Australia and Japan. And another extension is also into Ukraine, uh, which we know is, is, is a war zone since a couple of years, and again, there, of course, the environmental conditions for children, for education of children, again, poses some very specific challenges 
Um, and uh, I think this is where, again, uh, mediation in fostering understanding of each other can really play a large role. Um, and Ryoma gave, gave a very nice statement about, about your experience with, with Haro, and when you also talked a little bit about some of the technological challenges we still have, um, I think, but, you know, I thought to myself, well, this is actually can also be something nice, right? Because there's nothing as nice as uh, if, if two people uh, can joke about the technological shortcomings, right, of, of a robot and doing this. Th there's nothing like connecting in this way, even across different cultures and, and maybe different continents. Um, Right from the start, actually, the guideline that uh, uh, UNICEF did, and I, s I really think they did a great work on this, uh, was kind of like a, a really a guidance for us when we thought about, uh, you know, how do we have to specifically take care about AI in the context of children. And I use two key words here on the one hand, protect and support, because I think both of them really go hand in hand together. It's, it's very clear that children need specific protection. Um, and um, I think we see this in many of the data, and it was mentioned um, that, that there is, of course, also an increasing experience of mental health conditions for a number of uh, uh, reasons. Um, so we need to sp take special care. But on the other hand, of course, th th there's also great support um, that we can give children at their hand. And this is equally uh, uh, actually backed up by the data. So, um, uh, you know, children, young adults all around the world use the new technology, and I have no doubt they will also use the most recent advances in AI very successfully to increase things like connectivity, to increase their own creativity. So it's really that both things, both protect and support go hand in hand. Um, and I think sometimes also a lot of people talking about the technology without listening to those who actually are often the earliest adopters, and those are the young adults and the children of the technology. So I think for us, it's actually uh, also quite good to more listen uh, to those people who are actually uh, using uh, those things first. So I already mentioned about uh, one of the, our starting points was using um, uh, mediation with AI, with embodied AI technology in an educational context. However, uh, at the same time, we also started another very exciting project about um, using AI technology in a hospital environment. Generally, we are interested in, in supporting children in vulnerable situations. Um, hospital environment is one. Conflict, disaster, flight, and displacement, for example, are others. And they share many common characteristics. All three situations, um, the needs of children are very often inadequately addressed. Uh, the reasons is not always the same. Um, uh, however, uh, the fact uh, stands out for all three areas. Children, I think that's very, very clear, need child-specific explanation and reassurances, something that is not always possible in all of those three uh, situations. Um, they often even need support in expressing their feelings, um, and, and there, there are some very exciting projects really focusing, helping children to tell others how they feel about things. Um, and they still need to be children, even in difficult uh, situations like a disaster or displacement. And often they need additional trustees because parents, who is of course a natural trustee for a child, is often part of that difficult environment, right? Um, parents are there in the disaster flight situation. They are part in the hospital environments. Children feel that their parents don't feel well when the children are ill. So that poses them in the situation and doesn't give them the ability to be a neutral trustee. We have started some very first exciting experiments with, with our very, very valued partner uh, in a Spanish hospital, in a cancer hospital in Sevilla, and um, we are expanding these. Um, we are in discussions on how we can use HARO in, in the many different contexts that are possible there, and also expanding this uh, into a second partner. Now I would like to come back to my first slide. So I mentioned social fragmentation is a huge issue for us. Togetherness uh, is maybe one way to approach this. And um, 
togetherness really starts in our society with the children. Um, and uh, we at HRI believe we have a unique expertise uh, on the interplay between embodiment, empathic behavior, curated social interaction. Um, you know, we have seen a very exciting development in the area of generative AI. Stephen mentioned that earlier. At the same time, in particular in interaction with children, I think there are also severe limitations that those systems have. And again, this places us in the challenges of created interaction. We want to continue to engage with our partners um, to make the expertise and the advances in AI available um, with the benefit of comforting and connecting uh, um, uh, uh, embodiments available to children in a number of different situations. And we want to do this explicitly um, also uh, and uh, really with a special focus on developing countries um, uh, because there, of course, the challenges are again slightly different. Um, however, um, uh, um, these are very young continents, right? Africa is a very young continent. So when we talk about the future um, and the future education and the future support of our children, uh, it has to be done in context uh, uh, with uh, those countries as well, of course, and they rightfully expect this. But one last thought is also, I think uh, we have seen the, in, the, in the recent uh, um, progress in generative AI systems on how we build those systems. And I think there is a huge discussion on uh, whether this will be able to continue in this way. Um, and uh, we believe that the future AI systems also has to learn in interaction with the human society in order to share some of our human values also in the developing AI system. At the moment, we throw a lot of data at those systems, and rightfully so, we would never do this with our children, right? Um, uh, we very carefully uh, curate how our children educate. And we believe in the future that children and AI systems will actually also mutually benefit from each other because they will have the possibility of learning alongside from each other in a bi-directional way learning values like we teach our children values in our society, how we grow about. Now, at the Honda Research Institutes, of course, we don't only focus on AI and children, um, uh, but uh, um, we have actually uh, identified the United Nations Sustainability, Sustainable Development Goals as guiding stars for our development of innovations uh, of putting AI and embodied AI technology into innovations, um, uh, of turning Innovate Through Science, our HRI motto, into something that has a tangible benefit, in particular in the context of the sustainability, uh, um, sustainable development goals. And with that, I would like to again thank the organizers very much for giving me the opportunity to briefly talk about HRI here and for you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you. Um, so we have some time for uh, questions. I would like to invite the people that are uh, here, so the speakers that are here probably to have a seat here, Stephen, Randy, uh, Judith. Um, yeah. And uh, we have also our um, uh, online uh, speakers. Uh, and now it's time for questions. So, is there any question from the audience? Selma. Hi, I am Wilson Guilherme. I'm from the UFI program programme in Brazil. Uh, I am a researcher and the right to romance. Uh, I am a young, young man uh, who bangs his curry for children's rights in Brazil in UNICEF project. Uh, and that is why for me the institution's proposals are always very important. However, as was briefly 
pointed out at the bang of the panel, there is an uh, interaction between AI and the mental health, uh, but such as ISPA and Lucia uh, have been used, for example, on Telegram as a possibility for mental health support, which can intensify the risks of children and adolescents online. My, my question is, then, who can UNICEF help in the debate about AI, children, and mental health? Thank you. Sorry, my English. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Stephen, would you like to start with this since it was about to be next? Thank you very much for that question. Um, you know, this is an area that's crucially important for us, but not just for, for UNICEF, for anybody working in the space of how children interact with technology, and especially in the context of mental health and mental health support. And I don't know who, nobody has all the answers right now. Um, what we know is that there's a massive mental health need. There is the potential for uh, technology to support, and there is a potential for technology to also get it wrong, um, which could have very severe effects if it does, that gives the wrong advice or inappropriate advice or potentially shares information that was given in a very confidential environment out. And so it's a very, very sensitive space. Um, I think we, we all need to get involved here. We need the children, we need, um, of course, the, the technology developers, we need a responsible, um, as Bernard said, responsible development approach and this is not an area that we should rush into, for sure. Um, but yeah, we, we need to watch it. It's, 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 it's going to happen. Um, if we get it right, there is huge potential um, for, for providing support. And I think, you know, as I said earlier, what's, what's really happened with ChatGPT, it's, you know, everyone talks about that as the one thing. And of course, foundational models are not new. And there are other models, not just ChatGPT, but that's the one that everyone it's kind of become the placeholder for you know this whole new um, moment, cultural moment as a not just technology, technological, but cultural moment. As a speaker said earlier, um, that AI is now kind of it used to be in the background, the algorithm, your news feed, the the bunny ears on your your Instagram um, photo, your Snap photo. It's now something you interact with, um, and we just don't know what the long-term effects are. Um, this is why we also need solid research um, around the impacts of children and AI as they interact, um, and all of us. But of course, we, we, we focus on children for, for you know, the opportunities and also the potential risks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Judith, you also do work uh, with mental health. Would you like to... Um, <laughs> Sure. Th yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, I was just nodding as Stephen was talking because everything he said completely resonated. Um, I, I think one thing I would like to say is that right right now in the world, there are all, like all of these initiatives happening where people are thinking about things like governance for AI and governance for the metaverse. I just really think that we have to prioritize including young people in those conversations. So, if, I mean, UNICEF, of course, does that brilliantly, but I think so many more organizations need to Every time I'm in a room where those conversations are being had and, you know, the youngest people look like me, I know we have a problem. So, you know, whatever we can do to make sure that young people are in all the rooms they need to be in, we definitely should. Um, and then I just wanted to say, you know, you were talking about getting it wrong. And I don't know if people saw, but in the news recently, um, BBC was reporting about a, a young man who had, you know, been arrested on the grounds of Windsor Castle for trying to kill the Queen. and. He had been um, egged on by his um, AI assistant to, to go and do it. Um, so already, <laughs> you know, we are seeing that we don't quite know where we're going with these technologies, but we definitely have to come together to figure out what future we want for ourselves. Thank you very much. First, I, I would like to do a small rearrangement. So you belong there, please. <laughs> it's about children. Randy, would you mind to go <coughs> to sit there so I can... Is it okay? Okay. Thank you very much, and apologies for the interruption. Um, any other question, Selma? Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Selma Shabanovich from Indiana University. Um, it's such a pleasure to see the diversity of projects and different kinds of thoughts that really all focus on children and their presence in the work. Um, one thing I was curious, Steve, you started with kind of saying you had developed these guidelines and you knew they weren't the end. Um, and then you had so many different really interesting things go on. So I was just wondering if um, both you and the folks who participate in the projects could speak a little bit to, you know, either how the guidelines were things that were kind of present um, and helped them in the, in the projects and or how their projects, how they see their projects as expanding on or further defining aspects of the guidelines that maybe weren't already in there. Thank you. Thanks, Selma. That's a really great question. Um, so the, the eight, and I should have mentioned this earlier, I'm sorry. So the, the guidance has been published and the eight case studies are online on the UNICEF page. So I would really encourage everyone to, to look at each one because um, we, we wanted a diversity of projects um, from different locations, but also different contexts. Like some of them, some of the projects do, uh, the one, in, one of them in Finland provides mental health support. Um, or at least, sorry, mental health uh, information, not to support, but where children can find information as a kind of a first point of call um, and initial questions around potential symptoms and, um, and looking for that first line of kind of informational support, not therapeutic support. Um, but that was one of the case studies and that was done by the, is still done, it's an ongoing project by the, um, the Medical University of Helsinki um, and so that was interesting because they had a, because it's a hospital, they, um, you know, in a, in a very uh, developed nation in a sense, technologically developed and also kind of government supported, they had many ethicists on their, on their team that developed the product. So not only software developers, but ethnographers, researchers, ethics team, doctors, psychologists, and obviously did a lot of testing with the children. So um, we chose that. There's MEC 3D, also mental health support, um, but not necessarily for the patient, but actually for the people around the patient or around the, not the patient, sorry, the, um, the child on, a, on, on the um, spectrum. Um, and then, for example, we did one in, well, with the Alan Turing Institute um, in the UK that was a really nice example of how you engage the public on developing public policy on AI. Um, and they've actually gone on to, while the case studies are kind of finished, the work continues. So the Alan Turing Institute has been asked by the government of Scotland to engage children in Scotland on AI. And what excites them about AI, what worries them, and I think we're gonna come up a question on that. What kind of future do they want? Um, and so the Alan Turing Institute and their initial reports and methodology and everything are online. It's a really rich resource. Um, and that will inform, you know, policymakers as, as, they, as they regulate. So we, we were, it was interesting. For us in the end, after the eight case studies, the, the guidance didn't really change so much, um, which was kind of a relief. We thought like, wow, we, we seem to get it kind of quite right the first time. Um, but it might also just be because the guidance is almost at the level of principles. Um, and we do that because we're a global organization. And so you you have to be quite kind of high level or generic, and then it gets adapted at the local context. Um, the unfortunate thing is that everybody wants the details. How do you adapt it? And that's where, you know, that's, that's the challenge. How do you move from principles to practice? But that's where, in the end, we kind of said, the guidance hasn't changed that much, but it's been enriched by these case studies. If you want to learn kind of how different uh, organizations have applied them, um, then go and read these. And, I'll just say one more thing. Um, there are nine principles or requirements for child-centered AI in the guidance. Um, like, for example, inclusion of children in developing AI systems and policies. We found in the end that all of the case studies only picked two or three. Um, and, and we realized that that's actually fine. In your project or in your initiative, there are two or three that'll speak more to you than others. So if it's participatory design, um, and the inclusion of children, that's one thing. You know, if it's fairness or discrimination. Um, and so it was really un collectively unpacked all nine, but in the end, only a few tend to kind of be the focus for, for your work.
yeah, so everything's online. Um, we are really, of course, just thinking about if there's a need to update them or kind of add to them now in the light of generative AI. And as I said earlier, you know, there are a lot more unknowns now. Uh, we don't know how the human computer interaction will evolve over time. And we want to kind of make it work in a way that upholds rights and be responsible. Um, but we are, everybody kind of, you know, building the plane or fixing the plane as we, as it's in the air. Um, so we, we are very keen to do more work in the space um, in light of kind of ongoing developments. Yeah. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, is there any other question from the audience? Yes, please. Hi, um, this is Edmund Chung from Dart Asia. We also operate the Dart Kids domain, and um, what is being done here is great. It's uh, w definitely something that that Dart Kids will will like to take on and also help promote. Um, but asking as as a, a, a personally, um, w I wanted to ask. Uh, I guess it's Ruyama, uh, Ruyuma. <laughs> um, one of the last comments uh, kind of gave me a little bit of a concern. Um, you last comment was that maybe the evaluation or the assessment can be more fair with AI. Of course it could be, but it could also be less fair. Uh, and that's part of the, the discussion, that, that's the heart of the discussion. So what if it's not fair? Um, and that brings me to, to a second question that I um, wanted to kind of ask as well. Um, I think it was mentioned that um, for the Uganda project, it was focused on um, fairness and, and ex uh, uh, exploring fairness, but I didn't quite understand from, from Joy uh, what was being discussed, how, how part of AI was part of it. It would be useful to, to get, us, uh, get more of that um, because really, um, Actually, as a father of an eight and 10 year old, I'm quite pleasantly surprised that my 10 year old just now in, in, in year seven have told me uh, uh, this September starting, their teachers are actually getting them to use AI to help them with homework and being part of the curriculum. So it's really exciting for, for me, but also, you know, because we know that technology is not entirely neutral, especially when we talk about these things, um, it's a symbiotic relationship. As much as we shape them, they shape us, especially kids going forward. So that's why I wanted to really hear from the experience. You, you had an ending you know, remark about fairness and then you know, how's, how, how AI and fairness really works and in, 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 in the response from the, 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 the case study. Thank you. Um, thank you. Do you mind if I get a question? Because I did the study with <laughs> the kids uh, uh, in Ugadan Fairness. Uh, uh, is it okay with you? Um, so, uh, indeed, uh, the, the talk by Joy was focused on something else, not on the specific uh, study. Of course, we have published, uh, so there is a scientific publication on this. We can uh, share the links later. Uh, so, the main uh, research question for this study was to understand if there are cultural differences in the perception, the perceived fairness. So uh, we wanted to see how children in these two uh, environments with the cultural but also the economical uh, differences they had, they would focus on different aspects of fairness. So uh, what we did, um, we provided different scenarios. We let the, uh, the, the, the whole activity was based on storytelling uh, frameworks and we let the kids uh, talk about these scenarios uh, in their own words, their own drawings, etc. Then I said, uh, some uh, researchers analyzed uh, in a systematic way this data. And what we found was that uh, indeed uh, children in, uh, in Uganda focus more on uh, aspects of fairness that have to do more on the material uh, um, aspects, so they would talk more about uh, uh, how, for example, something was shared among children, etc. While the children in Japan would focus more um, 
on psychological effects. So, for example, they would talk about behaviors of teachers, or they would talk. So, this this was this is just an example to see how the priorities probably probably when we abstract uh, the the actual notion of fairness doesn't really ref differ a lot, but uh, in when we go in details, we see that children in these different cultures prioritize in different ways. So that was our, uh, the results of our study. Of course, this was only the starting point, and there are a lot of to, to explore. It is not only us. There is uh, a huge community on develop of developmental social psychologists that uh, explore this topic. So the first question, um, uh, do, you, do you want to repeat the first question? <coughs> Yeah, I guess um, just want to ask you. You mentioned at the very end that uh, may, if I understood you correctly, you're saying that assessment, maybe of your work uh, through AI, might be more fair. Um, tell tell us more a little bit more about it. What if it's not fair? How do you know it's not fair? Are we? What if you trust the the machine too much? Uh, is there someone, Judith? You don't or. Uh, I, thi I think um, some school teachers have uh, uh, in individual individual individual, um, individual evolution sense <laughs> sense so what is the language no no echo no echo so, teachers' evolution sense, 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 the the way of judgment is not the inner inequality. So, um, I, I guess um, AI can fair evolution. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, apparently, probably there are some hopes here, right? So I don't really uh, believe that, uh, you know, there is like uh, this, uh, um, nobody believes that, uh, you know, it's like fair, right, a absolutely fair evaluation with AI, this is, uh, this is true, but probably from young students there is a hope uh, when they see their systems or their schools uh, um, uh, evaluating in different ways and probably they experience a little bit of human unfairness, probably they put a lot of, you know, some hope on AI, but of course uh, this is something that we really, really need to take very seriously. Yes, please. Hi, my name is uh, Zanue from South Africa and Zambia, and this is not a question, I think it's more of a comment just listening to the, the discourse. Um, there's a concept that, that we use quite often in South Africa, and I think it's quite pertinent here, progressively realizing, right? So I think when we speak about AI, especially at the stage that we are uh, globally, um, your question is quite important. You know, what is fairness? Uh, what are the assessments? What's the criteria? And you quite correctly put in different um, geographies, instances, even in the same locality, based on uh, multiple var uh, var or various factors, that that concept of fairness really is so subjective. And I think what AI does is, is it gives us objective almost element to these very subjective things and you tweak it accordingly. And that's why it's so important if we speak about, I mean, I think the question on fairness really does um, uh, you know, veer off to you know, algorithmic biases that we do speak about. Um, that I think is also very pertinent for this conversation, where the more data we have, um, and, and the more data that we have based on your comment on this context, this context, this context, we develop, right? So I think the answer to the fairness question is we're progressively trying to realize that. And I think we're at, at a really an infant stage when it comes to, to that. Uh, and hence, you know, the data conversation is quite important to pair with this one. So yeah, that's just maybe... Summary. <laughs> Thank you very much for the intervention, uh, indeed. I'm afraid we're running a little bit out of time. So um, now I would like to give uh, um, uh, the floor to our online moderator, who is also our rapporteur. So Daniela Di Paola, um, can we have Daniela on the screen, please? 
uh, is going to um, give us uh, um, her view of the conclusions of, uh, of this workshop, uh, Daniela. Um, yeah, please. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for your wonderful comments. I think this is a very productive discussion. I really think that the different perspectives added a lot to the conversation. Um, I'm gonna share two key takeaways and two call to action points. So the two key takeaways, the first is that despite the challenges in terms of infrastructure in our activities for AI and children's rights, children from underrepresented countries and cultures should be included. And it's urgent that tech in technology that's being developed for children, we consider the needs and interests from all children and not only those from privileged backgrounds. Secondly, the project is not only the first step of responsible design of robots for children and various communities can contribute to its expansion, such as adding to the rights for explainability, accountability, and AI literacy for all. Formal education can be proven powerful and industry experiences with responsible innovation can be a catalyst for the well-being of all children. Secondly, I'd like to share some call to action points. The first call to action is that expansion of the implementation of the policy guidance to additional contexts, such as hospitalized children or triadic interactions, um, and also formal education with the inclusion of schools um, is very important, such as also adding the underrepresented um, groups of people, such as those from the global south. Secondly, there's a call for the necessary infrastructure and technology development that will give all children equal opportunities in an online world. We need to ensure that AI opportunities come together with responsible and ethical robot designs. Thank you. Daniela, thank you so much. Um, it was really good. And I think it's time to close, Steven. So the floor is yours. So firstly, thank you very much. I, I think the, the, um, one of the key takeaways is that this is the beginning of a journey. Um, so we were very happy to share with you what UNICEF has done and what our partners have done here and many others that aren't being mentioned uh, as we try and kind of work out how children can safely and in a supported way and in an empowering way engage with AI. The reality is that while we sit here and debate these important issues, children are using AI out there and it's gonna go up more and more every day. So it is urgent. Everybody needs to get involved. Um, thank you for raising the, the data issue. It's, it's, it's really critical and to Daniela's point, um, we have this challenge of data where the data sets are not complete. They're much more kind of global north. Um, we need data from children in the majority world. I like this term um, that's being used a lot here um, and in the global south. But how? But we know that data collection at the moment doesn't often happen very responsibly. And so we need to kind of, you know, tick those two boxes at, at the same time. Um, so the journey is going to continue. Please work with us and we will work with you. Um, and we need to work, I mean, we keep saying this, but it, it really is critical um, to work with children and to walk with children on this journey. So, Roma, thank you for being here. As the <laughs> um, and thank you for being involved in the project. Um, we recently engaged on, at work um, a digital policy specialist from Kenya uh, who could easily have been on this panel. And she was just making this point about Africa being such a young population and how crazy it is just seeing more and more how older people, uh, like us, sorry, I'm speaking for all of us here, I'm taking the liberty, <laughs> are regulating a technology that we don't really understand and that's so much used by a generation that is gonna be so much more impacted by it and we're not having them at the table. So it was, that was a really well put um, point. So for all of us here who do bring children to the table, well done and please may it continue. So, Thank you. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to all um, for the support. Thank you for uh, being in this session, and I hope we can continue this work on AI and children's rights. Thank you.